In early 2018, researchers in Rome unveiled the 3D carbon copy of what Jesus looked like, based on measurements of the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is a 14-foot linen cloth that is believed to have wrapped the body of Jesus Christ after his crucifixion. The statue is a three-dimensional representation in actual size of the Man of the Shroud, created following the precise measurements taken from the cloth. Giulio Fanti, a professor of mechanical and thermal measurements and a scholar of the Shroud of Turin, used his own measurements of the impression on the shroud to create the carbon copy. Professor Fanti has studied the shroud for the last 20 years and led the research team that created the 3D model of Jesus. Based off the model, they are able to tell he was nearly 5 feet 11 inches tall, whereas the average height at the time was around 5 feet 5 inches tall. Researchers believe that they finally have the precise image of what Jesus looked like. And based on the marks on the Shroud of Turin, Jesus received a total of at least 600 blows. The sculpture of his tortured body reflects these wounds. Professor Fanti said, I counted 370 wounds without taking into account the wounds on his sides, which the shroud does not show because it only enveloped the back and the front of the body. We can therefore hypothesize a total of at least 600 blows. Professor Fanti goes on to say, We have studied for years the image left by the body on the sheet, using the most sophisticated 3D technologies, and the statue is the final result. The University of Padau and Padau Hospital worked in collaboration with sculptor Sergio Rodella to create the life-size image. Now I read about 20 different articles on this topic, hoping to read about how they made the actual 3D copy itself. What technique or machine did they use? Did they sculpt it by hand or did they use some kind of 3D printer? But not one article or video covers that information. However, I found another video from July 2017 of a 3D statue made out of bronze, and the statue itself is from what I can tell from the video identical to the 3D carbon copy statue, as his pose and marks on the body look the same. They explain the process in making the statue in the about section on that video, and this is what they said. The shroud is encoded with 3D information that is found from the spaces between the highest and lowest points of the body and its distance from the cloth. Recently, a VP8 analyzer that gives topographical information about the moon and Mars terrain was used on the cloth. A 3D holographic image was formed of the face and body. An artist then used the exact dimensions of the 3D shroud image to create a bronze replica of the physical form of Jesus Christ. We have real blood, proven scientifically. We have an image that's neither painted, nor photographed, nor scorched, nor rubbed, or in any way made by the hand of a man. The image on the shroud is definitely not manufactured, meaning made intentionally to fool us. This shroud has been wrapped around the body of a man who was tortured, flagellated, crowned with thorns, crucified at the time of the Roman Empire. All of which corresponds to what the Gospels tell us concerning Jesus. The Shroud of Turin provides a great challenge for science. It's a challenge because it's a piece of cloth that contains an image with physical properties unlike any other image I have ever seen or anyone has ever seen. I have spent 32 years studying it. 32 years, half my life studying it, and yet I still don't have the answers. The man I worked with from Los Alamos called me again and he said, Barry, what do you know about the Shroud of Turin? And I laughed. 
I said, but I'm Jewish. <laughs> and he said, me too. He was also Jewish. And he said, and explained to me that at that point, a, uh, a number of scientists had taken a photo of the shroud, and he said they were so amazed that this image has such properties, they were going to put together a team of scientists to see if they could get permission to go to Turin and examine the shroud to try and determine how this image was formed. About two months into the project, I remember saying to one of the other team members, what is a Jewish boy like me doing on this? And he laughed and he said, you forgot that the man on the shroud is Jewish? And I said, no, I know this, I know. And then he gave me the best advice, maybe, of my whole life. He said, Barry, go to Turin, do the best job you can do God doesn't tell us in advance what the plan is, but one day you'll know. And this was great advice. And that kept me on the team. I was going to quit. But because of his words, from God maybe, through his lips, I stayed on the team. But the most important property of the shroud's image is the fact that the distance between the cloth and the body made the density of the image change. So the closer it was, the darker the image. The further away, the lighter the image. So the image on the shroud is not just from contact, because it worked at a distance from the body. So the correlation of cloth to body distance yielded different densities of the image. So when we looked at it with the VP8, we saw the natural relief of a human form. Now, how do we make images like that? We cannot duplicate this. And this three-dimensional information is the only image in the world that has this property. This image imprinted on the shroud was revealed in even more detailed relief in 2005 when it was transformed into a three-dimensional image. This was achieved by Dr. Soons, a doctor in Panama in Central America who specializes in three-dimensional imaging. The thing that stopped me from accepting the shroud as authentic for years 18 years, the blood on the shroud is still red. Old blood should be black or brown. And no one could answer for 18 years, why is the blood on the shroud still red? And then in 1995, in a telephone conversation with Dr. Alan Adler, Jewish blood chemist, who proved, by the way, the blood on the shroud was blood, proved it. He and I were on the telephone just having a conversation. And then he told me something I'd never known before. When someone is tortured over an extended period of time, 24 hours, 36 hours, right around the time of Jesus' torture, the body goes into shock. Jesus was given no water. He was beaten. He was scourged. Consequently, he went into anaphylactic shock. After a period of time in this type of shock, the cell walls of the red blood cells begin to break down. And the liver floods the body, the bloodstream, with an enzyme called bilirubin. And when that happens, the blood stays red forever. And when I found that out, that was the last piece of the puzzle. And that pushed me over the threshold and allowed me to accept the shroud as authentic because it gave me a scientific, credible answer to the last question I had. My life is better by a thousand percent than before because the shroud is in my life. So as a Jew, maybe the greatest irony from my life, I'm a Jew who can say that 
my faith in God was restored by my study of the Shroud of Turin. The clues that had been brought to light by the scientific research now made a medical examination of the image on the shroud possible. This examination revealed that this man had indeed been subjected to torture and that he had died by crucifixion. We don't see a man that's just dead. We see a man whose face is swollen because his face was beaten. And you can actually see one cheek is more swollen than the other, but both are. There are scourge marks from a Roman flagrum, which was a whip with three leather thongs, and at the end of each was a lead weight that's shaped like a dumbbell uh, the weightlifters use. And his body is covered with these scourge marks, over 120. In flagellation, In flagellation, as applied by the Romans, the blows not only tore the skin, but, as a result of their energy, which was absorbed in a few microseconds, they caused extremely serious internal lesions. It is truly a horrible torture. This was a man who, at the end of the scourging, was going to die. His kidneys had ceased to function. He was losing liters of blood. He was completely dehydrated. The man on the cross had no more than a few hours left. More amazingly, those crucifixion wounds in the hands, the blood stains on the shroud show crucifixion through the wrist because the Romans knew if they crucified in the palm, you could tear it loose. But if they nail you here, and the nail comes here, you can never pull this loose. We also see blood stains covering his head, as if from a cap or crown of thorns but not the beautiful things that the artists show us. Oh, the Roman soldiers were not going to take the time to weave a beautiful crown. They took a bush of thorns and smashed it onto his head, causing bleeding all over his head. Every thorn that touched his flesh would have been like an electric shock for a few seconds or even several minutes. We can hardly imagine this when we read in the Gospels, they crucified him. And we see a wound on his side. The darkest blood stain on the entire shroud is from this wound. And the blood actually went around to his back So we have this bloody cloth with all these wounds, and it is a perfect match to what it tells in the Gospels was done to Jesus. This is Jesus. This is his testimony. Here is what I have done for you. Here is what the Gospels say. Here is what I am saying. I confirm them. Here is what I have done. I was completely overwhelmed because a naked body, which had been tortured with traces of blood which were only too visible, should really have made me want to run away. But funnily enough, this was not what I saw. I saw a body, more than just a body, a person who seemed infinitely reassuring, 
filled with peace. And this wave of peace reached out to me too. And I received a very deep and indelible certainty, as though he was right in front of me, and he said to me, Don't worry, suffering does not have the last word. Death will not swallow you up. I've been there before you. I could say that I met him. I could say, like Froissart, he exists, I've met him, this Jesus of 2,000 years ago. I can say that I've seen him face to face. And this wave of peace, I have to say that it's... The word was made flesh. The Logos, he who is is the Word, he who is the Truth, the Life, he assumed a human body. He has placed himself within our reach so that we can reclaim our dignity. Surely it is our grief that he himself bore, our sorrows which he carried. It's as though he took the worst upon himself in order to allow us to breathe again and to continue to live after our difficulties and trials. He alone is able to transform our suffering. And the risen body came out of this fabric of death. And in the same way, he invites us to this same resurgence, this resurrection, and he shows us that we don't have to remain in the depths, but that his presence alone is itself a reassurance and can overcome anything. His hands are very beautiful. When I think that these are the hands which multiplied the lobes, which blessed the children and touched the blind, I see a man who is respectful, who is afraid of making me afraid. Because God is a little shy. He's shy because he's a beggar for our love. Our God, who is all-powerful, who could make the galaxies dance, is poor before me because he is waiting until I am ready to open my door for him. This information, or the fact that the shroud's image is a photographic negative, was discovered in 1898 and marked the beginning of a long series of photographic and data processing research. Therefore, the negative was the first step towards discovering another important characteristic, that of its tridimensionality. This means that the variations in luminosity that we can see on the shroud's image represent the characteristics of the tridimensionality of a face. This concept of tridimensionality had already been aired many years ago in 1902 by Paul Vignon who was one of the most important and famous experts on the shroud. However, it was necessary to wait until 1977 to see that when some processing typical of NASA was applied to the shroud's image, the first three-dimensional images of the face and body appeared.
In 78, Italy also saw the institution of a research group studying the shroud's image led by Professor Tamburelli, and the data processing methodology employed gave rise to a very particular three-dimensional image, an image with detail that emphasizes that we are effectively dealing with the face of a man that had been beaten. Some marks of torture are visible that correspond to what we read and is said in the Gospels. Therefore, tridimensionality is another important aspect. But this too is hidden information. As hidden information, there is that relative to foreign bodies, to foreign objects that have been thought to be present on the shroud's image. In particular, we can mention, for example, the imprint left by the coins. What you can see is a three-dimensional elaboration of a coin on the right eyelid that has left an almost unequivocal imprint, the presence of a question mark, and a part of the words Tiberioi Kaiseros. This, therefore, is a coin dating from 30 AD, and this would be a sort of intrinsic dating. Joining up with one of the few people in the world to actually have examined the shroud by hand. He discovered that clue in the cloth, the three-dimensional image. There's something missing, and that's what was the shape of the cloth when the exposure was made. We had to provide that and complete the data set. So with computers for the documentary, they have now recreated how the shroud would have been draped around the body. He says their 3D imaging reveals so much blood on the body. The amount of blood we found in the Shroud of Turin was extraordinary, beyond what I had envisioned. It's very dramatic to see. He was brutalized and murdered many times over. The face of the man in the Shroud was scarcely visible until a startling photographic negative was produced. But there is an additional, inexplicable property of this image which caught the attention of 3D computer graphics artist Ray Downing. Encoded within the fibers of this cloth, is 3D information which shouldn't be there. It's as if someone, using an unknown technology, hid a blueprint for constructing a three-dimensional statue within this two-dimensional image. Downing worked for over a year, extracting and refining this encoded information to create that statue, to reveal for the first time the face of the man in the shroud. This new portrait of Jesus drew worldwide attention in the news media and was the subject of a History Channel special. Inspired by quotes from the New Testament, Downing has gone on to illustrate a library of Jesus portraits based on the Shroud of Turin image, a face both hidden and revealed in time. Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me. Lazarus, come forth. O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If the world hates you, ye you know that it hated me before it hated you. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I am the resurrection and the life. My kingdom is not of this world. Somewhere there emerged three-dimensional information. To these practical scientists, it was as if they were looking at something from another planet. None of them had ever seen anything like this before. The VP-8 was the catalyst that caused the formation of the STIRP team. They said, we should see if we can figure out how this image was formed. Right. Peter Schumacher was a field engineer for the team that created the VP-8 which was originally designed to analyze images from medical resources and satellites. Nobody in our company had ever even heard of the Shroud of Turin, let alone seen pictures or wanted to look at image analysis of the Shroud of Turin. What the VP-8 analyzer does is plot the light and dark areas of an image onto a 3D grid. The nose has a prominence. The cheeks roll off. The hair has a, a shape to it and is rounded. 
The uh, whole image has dimension to it. The shroud is a very unique image, the only one of its kind in the whole world. Nothing else like it. Three-dimensional relief, the front and the back of a whole human being, only one in the world, no other. There are other striking anomalies as well. For example, it has long been known that in addition to the explicit detail of the body image, there are also other images that were somehow transmitted onto the fabric, specifically the image of flowers. I first noticed the image of flowers on the shroud in 1985. And uh, when I found what they looked like, uh, then I began uh, looking more closely and uh, found that there were large numbers of these. I contacted Professor Avi Noam Danin, the world's authority on the flowers of Israel, and uh, took some of our photographs out there. When I handed the photograph uh, that I'd uh, first spied the flowers on to him without indicating what we'd actually found, uh, he uh, looked at it for about 15 seconds and said, those are the flowers of Jerusalem. He immediately knew that this was a unique finding. But once it was discovered that there were other images on the shroud, Dr. Wanger began looking closer and found that there were small coins on each eye. What significance could that possibly have? Dr. Alan Wanger, in his book, The Shroud of Turin, Adventure and Discovery, points out that not only are they there, they present distinct and profound clues as to the date and origin of the image. Father Francis Phyllis was professor of the theology as well as a, uh, a, a scientist uh, who investigated the Shroud of Turin, as well as a photographer. He was working with a group of researchers who were attempting to identify uh, what the projections over the eyes were, thinking they might be coins. And uh, Dr. Phyllis uh, had uh, enlargement and made of the excellent photographs he had of the shroud and noticed the patterning uh, over the right eye. On enlargement of this, uh, he noticed that there were letters which he interpreted as U-C-A-I and something that looked like a shepherd's crook. This is typical of the leptin or the widow's mite struck by Pontius Pilate in the years 29 AD to 33. We can identify the, the images of them and so we can identify the particular coin and know the origin as well as the date, which both of them are, that we identify are struck in 29 AD. So this dates the shroud back to the first century. It also localizes it to Israel, since the, these uh, coins are just the widow's mites or the common penny of the time, and certainly would not circulate either outside of Israel or not very long uh, after the reign of Tiberius Caesar, to which they were dedicated. But how could an image containing so much information have been formed? There are those who believe the image could only have been formed by a burst of some sort of radiation. But the simple fact is, nothing like the shroud image has ever been found or reproduced. But that's only the beginning of the astounding information to be gleaned from this amazing image. Because it's got three-dimensional properties and X-ray properties, uh, the three-dimensional properties in particular cannot be reproduced by anybody today. Nobody on planet Earth can put three-dimensional properties into a two-dimensional cloth. The Shroud of Turin is unique on planet Earth. I believe that the Shroud of Turin proves the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that the image on the Shroud was caused by a burst of radiation given off at the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right, we're going to start with image 46. Those of you who have been to the garden tomb in Jerusalem, which I believe is the tomb in which uh, Jesus was actually buried, will have seen inside the garden tomb the limestone tomb, image number 46, please, uh, in which Jesus was buried. Now, the actual um, limestone uh, of that tomb is a particular type of um, stone which is only found in ancient tombs in Jerusalem and nowhere else known on planet Earth. It's actually called Tragatine Aragonite. Now, two scientists called Joseph Kolbeck and uh, Richard Levy Setti, American uh, scientists, they found that there were traces of this particular very rare limestone on the shroud. They found some of these on the, on the nose of the shroud, the left kneecap, and both heels. And they say that the Shroud of Turin was definitely in Jerusalem because they don't know anywhere else on planet Earth where Travertine Aragonite is found. 
What you're looking at now is actually Dr. Max Fry, who's a pollen specialist, a member of the STIRP team, Dr. Max Fry, and he found he's actually a botanist, and he found lots and lots of pollen and spores on the shroud. And he found that it had lots and lots of different spores and pollen of plants found only in Jerusalem. And that's Dr. Avinoam Danin, a botany professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He found Zygophyllum dumosum, the spores of that plant, and he found uh, the spores of a next plant, Guandelia 2040. Um, and he said that uh, this, the shroud definitely came from Jerusalem. Further evidence of the shroud is sudarium, which was the linen cloth over the face of Jesus. Now that shroud, the sudarium of Oviedo, over the face of Jesus, is actually in a wooden or oak chest in Oviedo in Spain. And again, Dr. Alan Wang has studied that and found that the blood type is type AB, which on both the Shroud of Turin and the Shroud of Oviedo, and the blood marks exactly match the the blood marks on the sudarium of Oviedo exactly match the Shroud of Turin, which mean they were both placed over the same corpse. That is very, very significant. All right, let's read from Scripture. Matthew 20, 18. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests, and they shall put him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and on the third day he shall rise again. All right, now let's compare to what's written in Scripture to the forensic evidence on the Shroud of Turin and see if it matches up. No less than seven forensic pathologists confirm without doubt that a genuine person made contact with the Shroud. He was dead, he was mocked with a crown of thorns, he was scourged, and he was crucified, and there's no evidence of decomposition on the Shroud, meaning that the body that was in there was not there very long, less than three days. We know for a forensic fact a man in the shroud was dead. The knees are in a locked position from rigor mortis. Who buries someone with their knees raised? Unless the body was in rigor mortis and you were in a hurry to get the body in the tomb. Just like the historical record in the burial of Jesus. There's a post-mortem side wound. That's a no-brainer. That means the person is dead. First stage of rigor mortis is what? The eyelids, the neck, and the jaw stiffen up. And you can see on the man in the shroud, his jaw is stiff. It's locked up. I mean, you can see visible teeth. And the final clue, the slightly swelled stomach. That doesn't happen until 48 hours after death. So the man in the shroud has been dead for 48 to 72 hours, and then his body was risen during the image process. So this matches the whole passage right from the beginning. The man in the shroud, he's mocked, he's scourged, he's crucified, he died, and on the third day, he rose. He was risen. That is what the forensic evidence says happened. In order to have distance information on the shroud, to have colored versus uncolored fibers, which represents the distance the body was to the cloth at the time the image was formed. That means what? That means the body had to be raised off the ground. There had to be a separation between the cloth and the body, and that means risen. So the man in the shroud was risen after three days. Bear in mind, the blood stains are first and the image is over the bloodstains. They are two separate events, and the forensic evidence tells us that this image process took place 48 to 72 hours after the blood made contact with the cloth. Those are the forensic facts of the case file, and they are indisputable. Anyone in disagreement is in disagreement with no less than seven forensic pathologists and blood chemistry experts. We know for a forensic fact, wrapping a dead body in linen will not leave an image behind on the cloth. We have over a thousand burial cloths from antiquity that had bodies in them. Not a single one has an image on it, except this one. And that's because this body and this linen was resurrected. What this really is, is a two plus blank 
equals four type challenge and only one answer fits. The only person this can be is Jesus Christ. He's the only person in history we know of that was mocked, scourged, crucified, died, placed in an expensive linen, and told people previously he was going to be risen on the third day. And that is exactly what the forensic evidence says happened in this case. Jesus himself said, this evil generation keeps asking me to show them a miraculous sign, but the only sign I will give to them is the sign of Jonah. Now look at the right side of the man with the shroud on his forehead. What is that? That's the sign of Jonah. It's also on the heel, on his heel, on the back of the head, and on the sedarium ovietal four different times. I've never seen in any crime photo in the history of my life or any morgue photo blood take on the shape of number three and be on the side of a head or on clothing or on tools or weapons or a blood splatter on walls or whatever it is. I've never seen it. I do not believe it is a coincidence. Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at the sign of Jonah on the Shroud of Turin. Beyond any reasonable doubt, beyond any doubt, the man in the Shroud is Jesus. The Shroud has properties of a photo negative, an x-ray photo, and a hologram, both a transmission hologram and a reflection hologram, but yet is neither. It is not a hologram, it is not an x-ray photo, it is not a photo negative, it is a combination of those three things. So the shroud image is what? A photographic x-ray holographic image. That said, how many other dead bodies have left a photographic x-ray holographic image behind on a burial cloth or linen as a result of making contact with it? None. So this argument, well, that could have been any person in that cloth. The Romans scourged and crucified a lot of people. Uh, that argument doesn't fly at all. We could take one million different dead bodies right now, all scourged, crucified in the exact manner of the man in the shroud. Pour myrrh and aloes over the bodies, wrap them in every kind of fabric ever known to mankind, and we will never get an image like we see on the shroud of Turin. So we have established a very important forensic fact. What is that fact? Putting a dead body, wrapping it in linen, will not leave an image like the shroud behind. The only image that you would have would be the blood stains as a result of body to cloth contact. There's not going to be a thin, superficial image over those blood stains, to say the least. There is only one thing that we know of on this earth that matches all these four unique characteristics. What is that? UVB rays in the UV spectrum at a very specific speed matches all of these characteristics and that is not a coincidence. UV light in the UVB range will cause rapid aging in skin, dehydration, oxidation, meaning a chemical reaction takes place and causes your skin to turn a sepia color, a tan and it only affects the superficial layers of your skin. Note there is a difference between sunlight and laser light. The UV light source making contact with the shroud is traveling at the same speed as UV light from the sun, but it is a different type of light. It is light of a single wavelength, which is a fancy way of saying laser light, versus sunlight, which is light photons spread out in all directions. And in fact, it would color all the fibers. It wouldn't leave some fibers colored and others uncolored. So light from the sun would not, is not responsible for the shroud image. Immediately eliminate sunlight and camera obscura as being capable of producing an image like the shroud. There are 200 fibrils in one fiber of linen. Only one of them has been colored, leaving the other 199 completely untouched. And that is because those linen fibers were exposed to UV light, laser-like light of a single wavelength, made contact with the fiber. It also caused it to become dehydrated. And a chemical reaction took place, causing it to turn a sepia color. And because it's UV light of a very specific speed in the UVB range, it only affected the superficial layers of the fabric. I just described how the Shroud of Turin linen fibrils were colored. Congratulations, you just learned in part, notice I said in part, how the image on the Shroud was formed. 
All right, let's go a little bit deeper. Is there anything in the human body that emits laser-like light in the UV range? And the answer is, yes, there is. Human DNA emits photons of light in each second that passes. It's laser-like light, and it is also what? It is in the UV range. In each second that passes, we emit approximately 100,000 up to 1 million photons of light in every second that passes. We just quoted you a scientific fact that has been observed. That is not wild theory, that is not speculation. So we know it's possible that DNA can emit light. We believe the process is amplified. Now imagine that process amplified as if you brought a multi-wave oscillator up to your body. A multi-wave oscillator emits moving electrical signals. It will cause your living cells to increase in AC voltage. And whatever that machine is set at, let's say it's 2 billion cycles per second, your cells will also oscillate at 2 billion cycles per second. It will match whatever the machine is set at. In a comparison analogy, if you had a tuning fork that was dead and you brought another tuning fork up to that one that was vibrating at, say, 2 billion cycles per second, the other tuning fork that was dead will come back to life again slash begin vibrating at the same speed the other tuning fork is vibrating at. So it will match its speed. So what we have going on in the shroud image is what? The field action of resonance. The field action of resonance is not unlike bringing life to something that was dead. Something that was unmoving now becomes moving. Something not oscillating now is oscillating. In the same way, a moving electrical signal was brought up close to the body of Jesus and caused his unmoving cells to start moving slash oscillating. This caused light to emit from the DNA, which made contact with the shroud fabric. So a moving electrical signal, a source of light radiation, oscillating in the UVB range came right up close to the body of Jesus and caused his DNA to oscillate at the same frequency. And this particular frequency causes the DNA to emit light. And that light made contact with the Shroud of Turin. And where the cloth was close to the body, more fibers were colored. And as there was greater separation, less of the linen fibers were colored in a manner which represented the exact distance the body was to the cloth and what we see as light as being dark. So the image has all the properties of a photo negative, also has properties of an x-ray photo, also has properties of a hologram, both a transmission hologram and a reflection hologram, yet is neither. So again, what is the shroud? It's a photographic x-ray holographic image beyond any reasonable doubt. Beyond any doubt, a higher power intelligence slash God is involved in the image process. This creator really went all out doing this image, photographic, x-ray, holographic image. He loved this man. He loved this man deeply. He loved this man deeply. He loved this man deeply. I just want to go over some final points of the shroud, some unusual aspects of the shroud image. The crown of thorns. Only Jesus was mocked as a king. And what do we see on the shroud of Turin? 30 puncture wounds around the head from a thistle plant that only grows in Jerusalem. He scourged and crucified. That's a contradiction. If the Romans scourged people like they did in the man of the shroud, that was routine procedure. They would have been nailing dead corpses to crosses. This is the most hated person in the city, and he's wrapped in fine linen. A body crucified and scourged to this degree would be thrown into a landfill, as in human garbage, not treated like a king. So this person has, he has rich friends. And that follows the gospel account. And there came also Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes about a 100-pound weight. That would be extremely expensive. It would never be used on an ordinary criminal. There's evidence of myrrh and aloes on the head cloth in Spain. Myrrh and aloes found in the blood by antibody antigen testing by a forensic pathologist. See, all these are all clues that say the same thing. This man is Jesus. He's loved and he's hated. And he has what? He has rich friends. 
like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. On the cloth is a first century style stitching pattern. That gives us a clue as to the age of the cloth. The shroud is eight by two cubits, an ancient measuring system. The image goes against how people would perceive a God would do things. When one thinks of the almighty, powerful God, creators of the heavens and the earth, making an image, we think of power. This will be a powerful imprint, as in firm contact with the linen. Yet the shroud is the exact opposite of what one would expect. Look at the two black eyes. When you look at the shroud image, when it's photographed, you can see detail. You can see that his eyes are closed. You can see the swelling more. And the same thing holds true with an x-ray photograph. An x-ray photograph on the film plate is black. It shows the bones as being black, and then the colors are inverted so the physician or doctor can see more detail. The shroud of turn image is just like that. When the colors are inverted, you can see the detail. You can really see the swelling. You can see the teeth. You can see that the eyes are closed. But when you look at the image on cloth, it looks like the eyes are open. As a result, you see in all the early frescoes, Jesus has his eyes open, and they're portrayed as big owl-like eyes because that's what it looks like. So we haven't even really seen the Shroud of Turin correctly until the last 118 years. Look at the vertical lines going down the sides of the face. That really looks out of place, as in, what is that? That's because the light source that's emitted from the body is coming out in a straight line. It follows the pattern of the swelling, but where the swelling drops off and the face drops down, that's where the image process stops because why, as we discussed in the first video, too much separation between the body and the cloth there. No image. We really see that clearly in the face along the sides of the cheek. And then we see the blood stain off to the left, which appears to be in the hair, which is actually a blood stain from around the area of the ear along the side of the cheek. So the blood stains are out of stereo register with the body, but it proves this beyond any doubt. The blood stains are first, the image process is a secondary event, two completely separate events, not done at the same time. And the forensic evidence tells us beyond any doubt that this image process happened 48 to 72 hours after the blood made contact with the cloth, and that fits exactly with the gospel account. This can only be one person. So the forensic science tells us what? The man in the shroud is Jesus. Not just beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond any doubt. Is 3D information which shouldn't be there. It's as if someone using an unknown technology hid a blueprint for constructing a three-dimensional statue within this two-dimensional image. Downing worked for over a year extracting and refining this encoded information to create that statue to reveal for the first time the face of the man in the shroud. This new portrait of Jesus drew worldwide attention in the news media 